literally no one asked for this video, but when has that ever stopped me? Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with kind of a double review slash discussion slash I don't know. <laughs> um, I have some things I want to say. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different books that are about or inspired by St. Joan of Arc. Um, this one is Voices, The Final Hours of Joan of Arc by David Elliott, which is a novel in verse. And then I also have Joan of Arc by Herself and Her Witnesses by Regine Pernod, which is translated by Edward Hyams, and this is a nonfiction book. So I'm going to share my thoughts on both of these books, so it will be somewhat of a review, um, but then I'm also going to talk a little bit about how my reading experience of one really informed my um, reading or reread of the other. Um, and I'm also going to end with just some kind of general thoughts on how we adapt historical figures because um, I just think that's really interesting and these books definitely made me think about that a lot um, and I also want to mention that I read these as part of the um, Read the Renaissance book club that I've been reading along with. I will link Julia and Helen and all the info down below um, and I'm really glad that I've been reading along because I don't think I had heard of this book before, um, the nonfiction one, and I'm really glad I read it. I also want to mention before I get into the discussion that this review is going to have some references or discussions um, because of the subject matter to um, execution and also references to a attempted sexual assault. I'm not going to go into detail about those elements, but based on what I'm going to be talking about related to Joan's life, um, those might come up, or those will come up. Um, so I'm going to start with a very, very quick review of Voices. So this is a very short novel in verse, and it's a really interesting concept. It's a bunch of poems about St. Joan of Arc. Um, some of them are from her perspective, some of them are from other characters' perspectives, and a lot of them are from like different objects. Um, around her, which I think is a really cool concept, and David Elliott also used a lot of poetic forms of the era, um, and I think he used those really well. Um, I think this is a really great example of a well-done novel in verse. I think the poetry itself is good. Um, I think as a fictional piece it is interesting. Um, I'm gonna get into some of my problems with it in a little bit, but this was a really interesting experience because this was actually a reread for me. I first read this book a couple years ago and I really enjoyed it. I gave it four stars at the time. This time around I haven't read it yet. I'm not really sure what to do about it. Um, I do want to mention though it is a thousand times better than The Language of Fire by Stephanie Hempel which I ranted about a few months ago. That one is not good. So if you're going to pick up one novel in verse about Joan of Arc, I would definitely recommend this one over the other. I thought since they were reading it for the book club then I would take this opportunity to reread it and I'm glad that I did still like enjoy some of it because I have been recommending it recently so it's good that it's not like you know terrible. I'm glad that I still enjoy some parts of it but I was partway through rereading re this one and then I was like oh I wonder if I should switch to the nonfiction book and read that first so that I kind of have that background and then go back to this one and finish it. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, I picked up Joan of Arc by herself and her witnesses by Regine Carnode. Again this is translated by Edward Hyams and this is a somewhat older book. It was first published in French in 1962 and then the translation in English was um, 1965, I think. So this is like kind of an older nonfiction book. It's several decades old, but a lot of it, I mean, the vast majority of it is like based on the transcripts of Joan's trials, like her um, trial of condemnation and then the trial of, her re of rehabilitation, which happened after her death. So I don't think this is the kind of book that would necessarily like go out of date. So um, I still think it's really well done and worth reading. And I'm very glad that I read it. And the way this one is kind of structured, is we kind of go chronologically through Joan's life and death and then her legacy um, and the author really like uses a lot of first-hand accounts like either from Joan herself we get a lot from Joan herself or from people who testified on her behalf during her um, during the trial of rehabilitation um, and I really like that like it was a very powerful experience to read Joan's own words obviously I'm reading them in translation so it's not like directly her words but it's pretty close and that was a really incredible experience um I I love how much of Joan's heart and soul like shine through this book and even kind of glimpses of her personality um of course we have like the transcripts we have from her are from a very specific context so it's not like like I'm not saying we can like perfectly know who Joan was based on this book or based on the records we have but it was really cool getting to know her a little bit through this. So each chapter contains a lot of like first-hand accounts and then there's also a commentary section um, where the author kind of puts things in context for us and like kind of does more of the analysis stuff. Um, I think this is a really like well-grounded book in terms of the history it's dealing with. Um, like I said I think that the way that Joan as a person comes through is really really good, um, really interesting. I liked that a lot in this book. I also thought this was well written and engaging and there was some unexpected humor in it as well. There's a few kind of like, I don't know, scholarly burns for want of a better term that I thought were really funny. Let me see if I can find one. This is what I was looking for. So she's talking about um, 
some like theories that are not at all well supported and that have been debunked repeatedly but that somehow still persist like one of them that Joan was actually a bastard of the royal family um and she so she's talking about one of these hypotheses um who started it it appeared for the first time in an article by one Pierre Caz sub prefect of Bergerac who was not an historian but was under the mistaken impression that he was a dramatist it's like Ouch. Um, I love that though. And that's actually another thing I really liked about this book is that she took some common misconceptions, some of which I had not really known about. Like I know some things about St. Joan of Arc, but I did not realize that the there was like this whole um, theory that she was actually a bastard of the, royal, of the royal family. And I think this author does a really good job of debunking that and showing how like that's not true, that's ridiculous. And she also says like it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of the time period because being a bastard of the royal family would not have been a big deal at all. There would have been no reason for them to hide it. So that among other things is pretty definitive evidence that Joan of Arc was not a bastard of the Orléans family. Um, so anyway I really like that throughout the book she would like mention some common misconceptions and then she would really systematically break them down. I think that was like and show how those weren't true so I liked that. I also think this book provides the most easily understood breakdown or explanation of the Burgundian Armagnac conflict in France at this time. Um, I'm going to briefly summarize it. Any mistakes are mine. <laughs> um, but basically the Queen of France um, signed away the kingdom from her son. So her, I think it was her son who was supposed to inherit. And he, and she instead said that the King of England would inherit the throne of France. And so he'd be like the King of both countries. And so some parts of France were really happy about that. They were very pro English. Those were the Burgundians. Um, and then some people in France really, really didn't like that. They wanted the queen's son, Charles, who would normally have been the heir to inherit. And so they wanted the throne to stay in French hands and they were called the Armagnacs. And so that's why within France, you have this English and French conflict because some of the people of France were actually supporting the English claim to the French throne. I hope that made sense. She does a really good job explaining it. Um, and Joan of Arc was one of the Armagnacs. So she was one of the um, people who wanted to put Charles on the throne like normally he would have inherited. Um, and they didn't want the King of England to rule France. I also think this book does a great job of showing just how rigged Joan's trial was. Um, like it really was a foregone conclusion. Like it was rigged in basically every capacity in terms of um, who was questioning her in terms of how the in, like the questioning was handled um the fact that she was re like they refused to put her in an ecclesiastical prison even though they were supposed to do that which would mean that she would be guarded by women um and they didn't they put her in a secular prison which kind of shows that this wasn't like a normal religious trial like they were trying to make it look like um there was the fact that she was pressured into signing um a statement like a document where she like repents basically about the bad things that she was accused of that she had denied but they kind of pushed her into signing one and then the one that ended up in the records is not the one that she actually signed um the fact that they never actually told her the specific things she was being accused of like all of these things where people along the way there were multiple people who were like hey this is not a legitimate trial like this is not how it's supposed to happen but this the outcome of this trial um was a foregone conclusion because it was being held for political reasons. Um, and that's another thing that I think this book did a really great job of showing is that Joan of Arc's trial and execution was a political trial that was disguised as a religious trial. Like she had managed to help Charles reclaim parts of France and also to get him crowned at Rennes, I think is how you say that. I'm so sorry. I actually looked it up and I'm still not doing a good job. Rennes. Rennes? I'll put the spelling on the screen here. But that coronation was very important and like a very sacred thing. And so now to the vast majority of the people in France, Charles had become like officially king. So the English and the Burgundians were scrambling to try and discredit that. And so they decided, all right, well, let's make like this young woman who made all of this happen or who was instrumental in making all of this happen. Like she is one of the primary factors, if not the primary factor that got Charles there to be crowned. Um, let's like get rid of her by like discrediting her and they're like well she's a like religious figure she's saying that she's doing all this on god's behalf let's try her for blasphemy and get her for that so like the reasoning was extremely political and there are other reasons that the author goes into about why this definitely was a political trial even though it was kind of like disguised as a religious one like i think that was just explained very very well so as you can see i really liked this book i thought it was really well done i'm so glad i read it um i gave it four stars i do think there are some parts that could have been summarized more like the um, descriptions of certain battle scenes or maneuvers like I think that could have been summarized more but for every part like that there were many more parts that I think were really well done and I'm really glad I got to read 
Obviously this book is hard to read in some places because of what happened to Joan, but I'm definitely glad I read this one and I learned a lot. Like there were, like again, I knew some things about Joan of Arc. Um, I've read things about her before and I really love her and admire her, but I did not know all the things in this book and I'm really glad that I read this. Oh, I also wanted to mention a couple things real quick about um, kind of what I was saying about how you get to see little pieces of Joan's personality, I think. Um, like she's really funny in some places. Like at one point um, early on in her like military career, um, I think it was, I think it was like a, a religious leader, like a priest or something. Um, somebody was like questioning her like early on. She had made all these claims about how she was hearing the voices of the saints and God had told her that she needs to do all of these things to save France. And so there were these people who were questioning her, like trying to figure out like exactly what was going on, like if she was telling the truth and all of this. And so one of them asked her like, well, what language do these saints speak? And Joan answers, better than yours. Um, which I just think is really funny and she's just so smart like I'm always surprised when I see references um, from like testimonials or, any or anything that talk about how she wasn't very clever except in terms of like military maneuvers um, because I think she's really smart I think you can see from her answers how smart she is and um, like she she talks circles around these like learned doctors of the church and these people interrogating her um, like one of the really famous examples is at one point they ask her um, if she is in God's grace. And this is a trick question because for context at the time, um, if she had answered yes or no, she would have been doomed. Um, because if she had said yes, it was considered blasphemy to claim that you knew that you were in God's grace. But if she said no, she would be admitting that she did something wrong and then they could get her for that. And so her answer is, like I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, um, if I'm not, may God put me there. And if I am, may God keep me there. And according to at least one of the like scribes, I think it was accounts, um, like they didn't know how to answer that. Like they didn't know how to respond because she beat them at their trick, qu trick question. Um, so there's like a lot of examples of things like that where like, I just, I think she is very smart and I love that we got to see that. So anyway, I talked a lot about this book. Obviously I enjoyed this one. And then after finishing that, I returned to Voices and I finished this and this was, yeah, like, like I said, my reading of the other one really influenced my reading of this one. Um, I do want to say though, the first time I read this book, even though I did enjoy it, I had some issues with it and I talked about some of those issues. So it's not like I would have thought this was a perfect book if I hadn't read that nonfiction right before. But I think reading that nonfiction book before this one really gave me specifics about some of the things that I did not think were done as well, or like some changes that the author made that I didn't like and think were not really well done. So I'm gonna start out with like a few of the small differences that I don't think these are like huge deals or anything but I wanted to mention them. Um, we have a few things like related to um, like Joan's relationship with her family, um, like her feelings about her vow of chastity and also kind of her feelings about her home life and um, or like her, her home life and her life in her village and everything and all of those things are very like the way they're handled in this book is very surface level and like I know it is short but the writing just felt very shallow and very like typical of what you would expect from like a modern view of these things. Also one of the things I'm going to be talking a lot about is how weird it is that some of these huge changes were made when we have transcripts of what Joan actually said. Now in these cases again they were smaller changes it wasn't like a huge deal or anything and um, I also think that we don't have as much information about Joan's feelings on these things um, as we do as with some of the other topics I'm going to get into so I just wanted to mention those like it wasn't like super imaginative I feel like the things that like the, the perspective on those is pretty much what you would expect from a like book about a strong woman that's appealing to a modern audience um, like wanting to you know make more of her life and like the, her father was very was characterized in a very like stereotypical way um, so like that kind of thing like it wasn't th those weren't big changes but I wanted to mention them um, and then the other thing like was the way that Jones ambition was portrayed in this book now ambition is not a bad thing ambitious women are not bad women but I think it's odd that this book talks about like voices um, the novel in verse talks about the the dreams that Joan had to like do something great with her life and like this this very ambitious part of her personality like ambitious in the sense that like she wanted to do something great um, and she believed she was she was like destined for more and things like that reading the things that she says about herself in her in her transcripts and also the testimonials from people who knew her very well and who worked with her very closely she was actually an extremely humble person like she says multiple times that she just wants to like do what she was sent to do and then go home and tend to her animals like she used to do um so again ambition is not a bad thing but this is kind of one of the things where i feel like 
David Elliott is writing this as what modern readers would think a strong woman would do rather than what Joan actually herself did or wanted um, or said. Like I'm putting this in the category of like small changes because we don't know like maybe Joan did have dreams of achieving something like she didn't refer to that specifically but like we don't know it's a possibility so like this isn't this isn't like one of the most most egregious changes I'm going to talk about but I did just want to mention that which because I thought that was like an interesting thing to change and it kind of fits into this larger pattern that I'm going to be talking about and that I have mentioned which is like reframing Joan to be more like understandable I think for a modern audience um, and then also there's like multiple things about the men's clothing versus women's clothing thing which was obviously a really big part of Joan's trial um, so in this novel and verse it feels a little bit like not like other girls um it's very much that feeling of like strong modern woman who metaphorically spits on dresses because like she's too tough for that or something this is another thing where like maybe joan did have personal reasons for feeling more comfortable in men's clothing like maybe that was something that made her feel more herself we don't have anything from her that says that um but like it's possible because like yeah maybe it wouldn't come up in trial maybe she felt like that would be that would make that would be um dangerous for her to say so i get that um in the tr in the actual trial transcripts she says that like the only reason she ever gives is that um god told her it would be easier to accomplish her goals if she wore men's clothing which like you know makes sense like they're like she's going into battle like wearing men's clothing and men's armor seems more logical um but again like this is one of those changes where like i think you could make the argument that maybe she did have personal reasons that we just don't know so like that's not like the biggest thing but there are a couple of other things about the dress the way the dress issue is handled in this book that did really really bother me um and this is where we're kind of getting into the category of like these are what i consider pretty significant changes that i don't like and i don't think are well done and i think kind of um obscure who joan was um so one of the really big ones is when joan like puts on men's clothing again because basically what happens is she finally agrees to wear women's clothing like after she's been like questioned and like chastised for it over and over and over and then she's kind of pressured into signing this like thing that basically says yes i admit i did these certain bad things and i'm sorry and i won't do them again like that kind of thing so she signs that she puts on women's clothing and then within a few days she puts on men's clothing again and then this is what means the um the church and the people like interrogating her this is what means they can actually like condemn her because now she has like i forget what they call it but basically it's like backsliding um and now they can they can go after her because she has repented but then she did the bad thing again um and the reason that david elliott gives for why she puts on men's clothing again is that she felt she was lying to herself and the reason this change bothers me is because we have two possible explanations from multiple witnesses about the reason that it actually happened um one of them which i think was one person who testified to this um but one person says that her guards actually um hid her female clothing and so that she would have to put on men's clothing and then they could um condemn her which would fit in with the whole trial being rigged so that would make sense um and then the other explanation which i believe everybody else like said this version like there were multiple witnesses about this version of what happened which is that joan put on men's clothing again because her guards repeatedly kept trying to rape her um and that it was like the reason she put on men's clothing again is because it was better defense against the disgusting people who were guarding her which would sadly also fit into what um like her general treatment and the fact that like joan was repeatedly asking to be put in an ecclesiastical prison which would mean she would be guarded by women instead and this is what was supposed to happen like this was a heresy trial and for like for those trials you're supposed to be put in a like official church prison um and she wasn't which is another reason why it's pretty clear that this was actually a political trial disguised as a religious trial um but anyway so yeah like those are the two explanations for what happened and it really bothers me that david elliott does not use either of those does not allude to either of those like that he turns it into this like like strong modern woman refuses to wear a dress kind of thing and again i'm not saying that we can definitively know that joan did not have these feelings like um whether about her gender or about how she chose to express her gender or just like her sense of self or even just her comfort like about how she preferred to dress like i'm not saying we don't that we know those things were not factors for her i'm saying the choice to kind of cover up like the explanations for what actually happened 
I have an issue with that. Um, it really bothers me. It's like, it almost feels like sugar coating, even though like this is obviously a, a fairly dark story because um, it follows Joan's life and death and everything. Um, but it bothers me that like that part is not in this book at all. Um, I think if David Elliott wanted to add some of that characterization, I think that's fine. And I just wonder why he didn't add that to one of the actual possible explanations we have um, that again were supported by multiple eyewitnesses. And another thing, just from a storytelling or like book writing perspective, if he had chosen to use either of those um, either of those explanations, it would have given the readers a better sense of what Joan was up against and what her circumstances were and or how this trial was stacked against her from the very beginning. All of which are things that you would think he would want to do, like he would want to communicate these things to the reader. So like I just, that really bothers me that he changed that and he kind of flattened it out into this like very easily understood narrative of like dress is bad, strong woman good, like you know. Um, so I didn't like that. And then the other thing about the dress, which like he just like ignored it, is the fact, that, and Regine Pernoud talks about that a lot in this nonfiction book, um, the fact that the, the wearing men's clothing thing was a scapegoat, like, or a, it was a total um, like decoy almost. Like they, the people interrogating Joan symbolically linked that to her refusal to submit to church authority, which by the way, she never actually refused. That's another thing that they misrepresented. Um, she never actually refused that. She repeatedly asked to be taken to the Pope to like have him talk to her and she would explain what she was doing. And um, that was actually very common practice. It might have even been required for religious trials, which is again, this was not a religious trial. It just was supposed to look like one. So anyway, like they wanted to show that Joan was refusing to submit to the authority of the church and their like excuse for that like what they made kind of symbolic of that was her refusing to put on women's clothing now i'm not like i'm sure there were people interrogating her who were like you know disgusted or infuriated that this woman would wear men's clothing i'm not saying that wasn't a factor but that wasn't like the whole reason it happened um and voices kind of makes it feel like like it kind of frames it as like the whole reason that happened as like men don't like it when a strong woman wears pants and that's why all of this happened um which again i just think really cheapens joan's story i think it really flattens it out um and i think it does her memory a disservice honestly like i mean this is this is why i'm putting these these changes in the like big changes category is because i do feel like it um it covers up part of who she was and it covers up important parts of her life and death um and i just think like i don't know it feels a little bit disrespectful and i'm not saying that that was david elliott's intention i really do think this book came from a good place but i think some of the choices he made do not necessarily reflect that and i think that a lot of these changes he made can be put under the heading of like easy feminism almost or like a modern like an easy modern view of feminism and of what makes a strong woman or an admirable woman um and as i said with the men's clothing thing like patriarchy definitely played a role in joan's life and death um and the way her legacy was talked about afterwards like it absolutely did but i think to reduce her execution to like some men didn't like it that she wore pants because she was just too strong of a woman i think that is very like very surface level um it's actually incorrect in a lot of areas and i don't think that's an accurate representation of like again we have we have joan's own words um we have the words of people who knew her very very closely um or personally and it just seems weird to me that an author would write a story about a figure who he obviously i think he does respect joan but it's like why would you make these changes then and, and i think almost like maybe it is coming from the fact that he does like joan and respect her so much it's like he really wants modern readers i think to admire her and connect to her so maybe that's why he made these changes that are very much like and they keep saying a modern audience obviously not all modern readers reading this are going to feel like the same way um but i think that's kind of maybe like the stereotypical modern idea of what a strong woman is um that she has to be very ambitious that she has to like disdain feminine things and that everything in her life can be explained by the way men felt about her these are all factors that like could have been present or in some cases definitely were present um like i said before like i definitely think um patriarchy played a, a role in what happened to Joan but that was not the only thing going on and again that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate the way that the nonfiction book talked about why this was a political trial and why that 
why those politics directly contributed to the outcome of Joan's trial and the fact that she was executed. Okay, so I've kind of done my very rambling reviews and discussions of the two books and I just have like a couple, I promise we're almost at the end you guys, I just have like a couple more kind of general things because again these books made me really think about how we adapt his, um, historical figures, um, especially in things like obviously that's a historical fiction novel in verse so it's not pretending to be um, or purporting to be a non-fiction book so I'm not attacking it for accuracy on those grounds. I'm saying that I personally think that when you are telling a story about his, a historical figure, um, especially one that is supposed to be so focused on them as a person and on their um, their actions and their life and their beliefs and things like that, I think that there is kind of this understanding that you will respect some of the most basic elements of their life and of who they are. And I think that whenever you write or do any kind of media about a historical figure from another era, um, you are naturally going to see it through a lens that is in some way affected by the time you live in. And I don't think that's a bad thing, I actually think that's a really wonderful thing that we can have these people who throughout history we can read in different ways and we can see in different ways, we can like relate to different parts of who they are and what they accomplished. I think that's wonderful. I think the difference though is when like when you put your interpretation of what they should have been on them, if that makes sense. Like, so the fact that I think Voices really was portraying Joan as like the stereotypical modern idea of what a strong and brave and accomplished woman would have would be today. So it's kind of understandable why that would color this interpretation, like this modern writing of Joan. So I'm not saying like I don't know where that interpretation came from, um, like I understand why that is part of the filter that was applied to Joan, but I think when you let those filters become the story, that is kind of a problem. Um, I mean, there's also the consideration that like St. Joan of Arc is a very important religious figure for a lot of people, but even aside from that I just think if you are taking a historical person period, I think that, I think like if you are, are retelling their story in a way that is indicating there is some attempt made to like portray them genuinely, um, like again not 100% accuracy because it is historical fiction, but you are in some way trying to represent who they are, I think that means that you should care about communicating who they are, you know? Like I think maybe if Voices had been framed as a modern Joan of Arc or like maybe he could have written it as a modern character, like a, maybe a modern young girl who is inspired by Joan and like her portrayal or her actions are much more like modern. Um, like I don't know, I think there are other ways he could have addressed, like approached this. Um, I think there are other ways the book could have been like labeled because like the subtitle, I don't remember if I said this, the subtitle is The Final Hours of Joan of Arc, which I feel like indicates a certain level of like historical detail that was not really present. Like again, those changes I mentioned, they are very big changes um, because of what they say about, um, about who Joan was. Like the fact that again David Elliott left out or like, like completely changed her motivation for like putting on um, men's clothing again, like I just, I don't know, I, I think I'm talking in circles at this point so I'm gonna just try and wrap this up. Hopefully I have communicated something that I'm trying to get across. Um, I just think it's a little sad that this kind of implies like was Joan not enough herself, you know, like we had to, like what she did and what she stood for and what she accomplished um, and the kind of person she was is not enough for for an audience. And I think it's also a little sad that like we're still misrepresenting her, you know? Anyway, so bottom line, I am definitely in favor, like obviously I love historical fiction, I definitely am in favor and I understand interpretation. Um, like there have been many like stories or media pieces like uh, Blood Water Paint for example by Joan McCullough that um, do make some small changes for narrative reasons but keep the core of who the subject is and I think that's really important. I think that's what I'm getting at is there are core pieces that if you change I feel like you're doing a disservice to the project and to this person, this real person. Um, and I, maybe like people would differ on what those core elements are but I think that is like that's like the main point I'm getting at is not that we can all necessarily always agree on what should or shouldn't be changed but that there are some things that maybe shouldn't be if you if what you are trying to do is celebrate a, a historical figure or communicate who they were as a person. So as far as the books I think my final recommendation is like again Voices the novel in verse is 
a really good piece of writing. I think the poetry is great. I think this might be great for maybe like sparking an interest in Joan of Arc if you aren't already interested in her. Um, but I think whether you read it before or after or during, which is kind of what I did, um, I do think that the nonfiction book Joan of Arc by herself and her witnesses by Regine Pernod, um, translated by Edward Hyams, I think this is a really good companion to that. Um, I think this this would be a great one if you are interested, like if you're already interested in St. Joan or maybe you like read this novel in verse and you want to know more, you want to know like more specifics or like more um, like in her own words or more accurate things that happened. Basically I would strongly recommend this as a companion piece but I'm not like steering people away from voices. I know I end up sounding very very negative about it but I do think this is a good piece of writing. I guess I just like it could have been way better, you know, and it could have been like what a, what a wonderful opportunity this would have been to show a a really competent, strong, like incredible woman um, who obviously she had a tragic end, but Joan of Arc is a really cool person. And this could have been such a great opportunity to show that those kinds of women do not always look like the same thing, you know, like that they, they don't always have to be in a particular mold. Um, anyway. This was a much longer video than I thought it was going to be, but I hope I communicated some things that I was thinking about. I'd love to hear if you guys have read either of those books, what you thought of them, or if you're planning to pick them up. Um, again, I, I sounded very, very, very negative about the novel in verse, but there are good things about it. This is not just this book, by the way. I, maybe I should have made that more clear. I'm not saying this is the only example or like the worst example of adapting a historical figure, because that like that's not what I'm saying. Um, this is just one that I obviously read recently and that kind of like restarted um, or kind of sparked these like ideas and these things that I'm thinking about again and that made me want to do a video on it. Um, but yeah, maybe I, maybe I should do a follow up with like some other historical books that I think did this well or did this maybe not so well. I don't know if anyone would be interested in that. I don't know if anyone's going to watch this one, but I needed to get it out. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye.